Okay, everyone, it looks like we are live. My name is Robin Kilgo, and I want to welcome you to our next ARCS chat. Um, just a couple of quick notes. We are going to be on a slight delay for those of you participating at home. So it's about 20 second delay or even less than that. So if we don't hear, see your question, we will get to it eventually. Um, we will be following along on Twitter and also on the YouTube comment section. So if you have questions for any of our speakers today, please put them in those areas. And on Twitter or any other kind of social media, please use the hashtag ArcsChat so we can follow along with the conversation. And without further ado, I'm going to hand the mic over to John Robinette. Hey, everybody. I'm John Robinette, one of your regular co-hosts, as well as uh, Amanda Robinson, and we are all here to feature our special guest tonight uh, from DeWitt Stern Insurance, it's Mary Pontello, and then from Huntington T Block, Adrian Reed, uh, coming from the central time zone, you unicorn. <laughs> <laughs> the best um, time zone. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's just, it's just such a rarity around here. Um, I mean... Uh, but uh, yeah, anyway, um, welcome, uh, welcome to the show. And we're here to uh, deconstruct our loan, contract and, uh, loan contracts and specifically the insurance requirements in those contracts. Uh, so hopefully everyone brought their questions uh, because this is going to be deep and riveting uh, in the sense of everything you know is completely wrong, right? I mean, <laughs> kind of the gist of, of what we're doing, right? So, uh, but before we get into all that uh, nitty gritty, what's going on with you guys? Amanda, what are you, what are you working on today? I heard you uh, didn't have any power at your museum. <laughs> yes, and the, and the way everyone wants to start their Tuesday is to come to work with absolutely no power or internet. Um, so that was a fun challenge. And then if you want to add on top of that, we were actually expecting a courier this morning to pick up loans and ship them out. Um, so we had a few hoops to jump through, but it ended up being fun. We were only out of power for about, I don't know, two and a half hours for the most part. And the temperature was pretty stable, although it was the warmest day this week that it's supposed to be. So I was very nervous that things were going to get haywire really quickly, but it ended up being okay. So it's a lot of excitement for a Tuesday. You know, I didn't need it, but I made it through it. So <laughs> I'm glad to be here. I was joking with Amanda. Is the coffee maker on the backup generator? <laughs> this is <what's> important. <laughs> I'm actually inspired that Robin said that you have instant Bustello, which is probably some of my favorite coffee, by the way, in your emergency yeah. pack. I made a note. I was like, put Bustello in your emergency pack. <laughs> I lived in South Florida my entire adult life and I am a good friend with Bustello. And when I figured out that was like an instant coffee, that is a key element of my emergency kit for hurricane <laughs> season, for sure. Um, if Bustello is listening right now, if they want to sponsor this. <laughs> accepting sponsorship. Please do. <laughs> Mary, Adrian, what, what's, what's happening in insurance world these days? I'm sure nothing, right? Well, never. yeah, never a dull moment. <laughs> I think Mary would agree we've entered into a hard market, which is an exciting time for us insurance nerds, uh, meaning that last year, Lloyd's of London suffered one of the most catastrophic years for fine art losses on record. So we are seeing uh, rates going up, which is impacting our clients. So uh, we are just uh, working hard to beat the math to get rates down. Wow. Yeah, and I would say, you know, having things like uh, just kind of gotten through the whole rigmarole of Art Basel Hong Kong, um, not so much a museum thing, but more of a gallery thing, you know, Art Basel Hong Kong just canceling and having to help clients navigate through that. That was, you know, definitely my first time doing something like that and giving advice and really, you know, guiding people through that. Uh, strange, strange time. And of course, you know, when something like this starts to happen, people start asking a lot of questions about what's covered, what's not covered. I mean, listen, I've got tickets for Disneyland for spring break and I got travel insurance and cobbler's kid shoes. I didn't even read the policy. I have a feeling that pandemics is not covered. That. Yeah. That's funny. <laughs> We're going to Disney next weekend and I'm kind of like, oh, should we go? <laughs> like, I'm kind of debating it right now. I'm like, it's, we haven't actually bought the tickets yet. <laughs> I'm like, so yeah, it's a big debate right now. In your loan contract, can you put, um, maybe not pandemic, but 
things that would uh, affect the courier? Can you put some sort of terms in there that like, you know, of course we're all watching. I mean, I was gonna discuss uh, coronavirus and Art Basel Hong Kong and, and various other cancellations, but like, it seems like the main hit there is regarding the courier. Is there a way to protect yourself in your loan contract as a courier? Yeah, I mean, I think that, you know, one of the things you need to be careful of, especially if you're an independent registrar, is to make sure that the institution has um, international workers comp. And I know that has nothing to do with fine art, but this is where, you know, insurance can get really, really granular and super technical. Um, but as a courier, if you're, you know, stuck in the middle of anywhere, and it could be a completely like nothing's going on at a pandemic level or a tragic level, but you could just be on a courier trip and get really, really sick and need specialty medical help. You want to make sure that the whatever organization sponsoring your trip there has international workers comp. Usually they have these little cards or an app that has like an emergency number so you can contact someone. So something like, you know, a you know, and there was that bombing in the airport in um I can't remember where it is now, but right, right around the same time as Maastricht, I think there was a bombing in the airport. You know, like if you were in the airport and you were there uh, doing a courier trip, you could have used one of those numbers just to figure out where a safe place was and things like that. So I know it's not always, especially I think as independent registrars, people are always excited to get work. But I think it's it's definitely important to make sure you're protecting yourself and your personal health and safety when you're going to be traveling overseas, especially. Who's responsible for that? Is that the, the person that's hiring the independent registrar or the loan? Well, the loan. as you all know, a lot of times in the art world, independent registrars are hired as 1099s or contract employees. So you need to be really careful because sometimes in galleries or museums will claim that they're 1099, so they don't need to put them under the workers' comp. But it really should be the person hiring you if you don't have your own workers' comp. So you just need to make sure that your contract addresses all of that. Gosh. It's really technical. And honestly, a lot of, <laughs> especially commercial galleries, don't quite understand it as well. So they really have to rely on their brokers to give them that information. It's a weird area, the 1099 thing. I feel like if I, um, this, this is a slight tangent, I guess, but I feel like if I did ask for those terms, as an independent registrar, they might say, um, you're difficult. <laughs> yeah. And that, I mean, I think that's where, yeah. and, and, and I totally understand that. It's like, you want the work. I completely get it. Yeah. I think there's so much, and we, and this is a perfect segue, honestly, into loan agreements and requirements. There's so much that people put in contracts, hoping no one will ever read it and just sign it. Right. Right. Yeah. And that goes for art loans as well. So, Yeah. But before we get into loan contracts, I just want to do a shout out for disaster preparedness. Um, so this is really like a perfect time to really just dust off those disaster preparedness plans. Make sure you have up to date, you know, telephone trees um, so that if your museum does get closed, uh, you know who to call and, and make sure that everybody's communicating. Uh, but in particular, be on, you know, communicating with your insurance broker and keeping them updated and aware of the situation at your museum uh, in the case that you have to be shut down and perhaps your level of security and protections are not at the caliber that they should be uh, normally. That's a super good point, because I mean, I know down here in Florida, whenever um, Florida is such a weird state where the hurricanes feel like they ping pong across the state a little bit. So whenever that would happen to us, we'd get online and talk to our insurance people being like, hey, we're, we've done this part of our plan. Right. So we've shut down to this mm -hmm. level, just so you know, and whatever. And that was always something that was on kind of our, one of our lists that we kept up whenever we did hurricane prep. So I'm glad you shouted out to that. Cause it's like T yeah. minus two months till hurricane season, so. Yeah, and <laughs> I also think on the courier bit, you know, it's also perhaps maybe a good opportunity to try to get some momentum on the, the courier referendum. You know, uh, because I know that everybody's thinking about international tra uh, travel and standards and, and maybe people are thinking, well, I, I, maybe we don't need a courier or how can we consolidate this uh, and share couriers. Um, so maybe there's some traction that can be made on that referendum as a result of this. We'll see. Well, we do have a uh, courier workshop learning, tra uh, training people how to be courier. Oh, that's right hopefully standardize uh, the procedure a little bit more. Uh, that's happening, what, next week? Uh, so 
um is it i assume that's already full but um you know you guys that filled up fast yeah. <laughs> so you get the yeah. answer from, for the test from all your friends <laughs> so so uh so let's dig into the loan contracts um i guess as good a place to start as as any is, you know, what's wrong with our current uh, insurance requirements on our loan contracts? I mean, I wouldn't say that there's anything particularly super wrong with it other than these, you know, particularly lenders that are being really overly aggressive in what they're demanding of the museums. And then the museums having to take the time to negotiate that back and forth and back and forth. Um, with the lenders, and that's really, you know, a time waste. Um, and at the end, at the end of the day, is putting the institution at risk as well. So, uh, and is actually act, act, requiring you almost have a, a legal degree to a certain extent, you know, and how to deal with these loan contracts, which you know is, is, is unnecessary. So, um, that would be my two cents on that point. Yeah, and I think, you know, to keep in mind, too, you know, Adrian and I both work with a variety of different clients, so some of our advice tonight might be more, like, my advice might be more like, okay, well, if I'm in the middle of a loan negotiation, and I'm, I might be representing the collector or the, the lender, or an estate or a foundation, um, or I might be on the other side and representing a museum. So I think it's important, I mean, one of the things I love to ask from the very beginning is, what's the nature of this loan? You know, if I'm representing the collector that's being asked to borrow, it's like, is this something that has to happen? Like, are you on the board of this museum? Do you absolutely have to have this loan go through? Or, you know, is this some random museum you've never heard of that's asking you if you're like your most expensive painting that's super fragile uh, with a lot of condition issues? I mean, so for me as a broker, it really helps to understand the nature of the loan. So on the flip side, if I was getting a request from a museum and saying, hey, like this is a loan, the lender's, a the lender's asking us for to jump through a million hoops to understand the nature of that loan, like, hey, this is the star piece of the show. Like this is what's going to be on the cover of the catalog you know, this was the artist's quintessential work, you know, whatever, like having a little bit of that um, background before we dive in. Um, and also keep in mind that as brokers, a lot of us have been on, have seen the other side of the transaction before. Like I might've dealt with that lender before. And I know that, as I said before, they might just be asking for everything but the kitchen sink or maybe in the kitchen sink. Um, but I know that they'll back off if we ask them to. So I think it's good to kind of start from, you know, what's the nature of this transaction? How much do we need it to go through? And then go from there. Do you think these really intense and aggressive um, requirements for insurance stem from say one or two incidents that kind of set a precedent? And as a result, people just have them as standard requirements even though they probably don't even understand what they're asking for? I think it comes from overly aggressive lawyers, um, personally. I mean, that's what we found, at least. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's it's aggressive lawyers. And then it's also, I mean, keep in mind the different reasons why different people collect art, right? I mean, for some people, it's a true passion. Yep. It's, you know, handed down. It's, um, you know, part of a family collection. And then for other people, it's pure mo mon money. I mean, that's it. And when you are dealing with the people who are dealing with pure money and they're buying blue chip artworks that are 50, a hundred million dollars, like they're not going to really sway on the requirements because for them, it's an investment. It's like saying, well, you know, here's a hundred million dollar painting, but for your loan, I'll just accept, you know, 700, you know, 750,000 for it or whatever. So it's, I think it, it, a lot of it has to do with values and the nature of who collectors are and what they're looking for in their collections and in a claim, unfortunately. And then again, go back to lawyers. One of the things to keep in mind is lawyers understand contracts, but most art lawyers don't understand art insurance. And it's really important yeah. to understand that because the lawyer, it really, you should be working with your lawyer and your insurance broker to make sure that that loan contract language is correct. Right. And I imagine yeah, so basically making sure that the loan contract is dovetailing and paralleling with your insurance policy, but then also from a legal perspective, putting the institution, you know, uh, in a safe place legally. Right. Yeah, I've often had to do that, especially um, not to jump ahead, but 
I've noticed, especially with a lot of international loans that I've done lately, that there's um, a request for absolute liability under insurance requirements. And um, that really threw me for a loop. And I, I leaned really heavily on our insurance provider because I didn't, I didn't understand what, was, what the language was in the contract. And I had no idea if our policy could in any way, shape or form come close to meeting the uh, requirements or if we had to do other additional insurance premiums or other things to cover it and what the risk really was. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, part of that is really de defining, like sitting down and actually looking at, okay, what are the exclusions on your policy? And what are the things we can tick off and say, okay, these are things that the institution is okay with dealing with uh, versus this is something that we're not okay with dealing with and determining if you want to spend the money to buy that extra insurance or to assume that risk or to try to really negotiate it away. And a lot of times, you know, if, it, if a lender hopefully, you know, understands the implications that, that you're putting the institution in a, in a significantly difficult position financially, hopefully they'll back down from that. Um, but like Mary said, if they have more of a financial interest in the artwork, then they're just not going to care. You know, they, they want to make sure that they get their money. Um, and that's where, you know, the rubber hits the road on this stuff. Yeah, I mean, and, and I think that one of the things to be most careful of, we chatted about this a little bit earlier, was the idea of any loss is a total loss. I mean, yeah. total liability versus any losses and a total loss are slightly different things. I mean, total liability, like Adrian said, would be, you know, okay, here's like the three exclusions you have. Like, what are the chances of these exclusion happening? Like, pretty much nil or we'll all be dead if they do happen. So who cares? Because um, we live in a bright, shiny place in the insurance world where we're all dead. Um, <laughs> so, or what the total... <laughs> I know. I'm like, well, if it's a huge terrorist attack, then we're all dead and you won't be there to collect insurance premium, insurance payments. Uh, anyway, um, I, know, I, need, I need a counselor that like sits next to me. Um, but the, the more um, difficult thing is any loss is a total loss. Have any of you all seen that requirement? Yeah. Yes. That's yeah, bad. it's really, really bad. tricky because it basically is usually going to be for incredibly expensive piece, right? Yeah. So 20, mm -hmm. 50, 80, 100 million dollar painting. And then it's like if someone breathes on it, the collector can say, well, you know, the lender can say, well, it's a 10 percent loss in value. And you're like, so pony up 10,000, 10 million dollars, you know, so it's that any loss is a total loss is really, really tricky slash almost impossible to get done. And I say almost because, I mean, our job is to figure out tricky stuff, but it is not a slam dunk. It is almost close to impossible to get done. So that's the one thing, yeah. like, if you see that, like, it's going to be tough. And when you go to talk to underwriters about this, you know, uh, they, they, they want to be creative and they want to find ways, but like those situations, it's almost like you already know that no matter what happens to that piece, you're going to be losing money right out of the gate. And so for them, it's impossible to underwrite a premium that would actually make it an economic, uh, good, economically profitable decision on, on the behalf of the insurance company. And they just can't, they won't do that. Mm -hmm. It's very challenging. Can we take a, 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 a slight step backwards here and, um, and I'm going to ask a, a fairly basic question, um, and that is, you 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 two work at two very different uh, firms, and um, so what is the actual difference between brokers? If many times you're going through the same underwriters anyway. I mean, I think yeah. a lot of it has to do with personality and who you like working with. I mean, Adrian and I have like similar amounts of experience, similar background. I think we have a very we similar approach. Each other well before this. We chat. do. <laughs> yeah, we know each other yeah. well. We haven't just become acquainted in the last 19 minutes. Um, it's a very <laughs> incestuous industry. I mean, we all know each other. I'd say we all like each other for the most part. Um, so I, I really think it comes down to personality and, you know, what the fit is for you with that individual. I mean, I recently sat in a little lecture and one of the one of the registrars was like, I just I always have to like get up the guts to call my broker and ask a question. And I'm like, that is crazy. Yeah. You, your broker is there to answer your question. So if you don't feel comfortable calling 
me at any point, calling your broker at any point, then you're working with the wrong broker. Like you should always feel comfortable enough. I joke, like if you're thinking about insurance more than like three minutes, it's three minutes too long and just pick up the phone and call your broker. It is weird esoteric stuff that like none of you should commit to like massive memory. That's why you have brokers. I mean, so I think that that's, that's really the big difference. And I, I joke too, that there's some of our competitors that like, if you would want to work with them, you're probably not going to want to work with me because we are so different just as far as personalities and stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, taking a step back though, because uh, I mean, Mary and I work for very similar firms, but uh, when you're talking about an insurance broker, there's, there is a big difference between a generalist and a specialist and somebody like Mary and I, who only, you know, do fine art insurance or only work with fine art institutions versus somebody, you know, that works at Bob's insurance agency down the street who works with coffee shops and, you know, restaurants, you know, um, those, that's a very big difference of an insurance broker. And I get museums uh, in particular that say, you know, I'm fed up trying to ask my broker questions they have no idea how to deal with art and and what the you know eccentricities are of of loan agreements incoming outgoming they just have no experience on it and so that's where they need somebody like mary or myself you know to come in and provide that specialized service yeah we see that a lot with like regional museums too where they're using like a local broker and maybe Mm -hmm. funneling it through a specialty broker but there's not like that direct line of contact between the registrar and, you know, the Adrian or the me. Yeah. Right. And you work with other people besides fine art institutions, maybe history museums or other types of collections. Oh yeah. Yep. Anything of rare historic value. Yeah. Yeah. We can ensure on display. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What about living? And we do galleries and collectors and shippers and artists and Mm -hmm. conservators, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead, Amanda. I was just asking, what about living collections like zoos or other types of institutions like that, botanical gardens and things? Yeah, we do less of that. Uh, I mean, personally at HCB, um, we, we do other lines of coverage for them, but we don't insure their animals. Maybe maybe yeah. coming soon. I don't know. Maybe in the same. Yeah. <laughs> same. It's a whole nother can of worms. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> can of zebras. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> So if, uh, if anyone out there has any questions regarding uh, insurance policies on your uh, loan contracts, uh, please do uh, chat us up on the YouTube or on social media with the hashtag ArcsChats. So let's, let's get into it. Should we, do we, is there anything else to discuss on the absolute liability? Should we just go straight to the jugular there? So can, can, what's that? No, we're good. No. All right. How about how about uh, how about the other massive topic here? Indemnity. You guys have some opinions on that, I reckon. Yeah, I think this is you know I I have a, a very mixed bag of clients, meaning that I have you know private collectors and estates and foundations and museums and packers and shippers, so. I tend to be on lots of different sides of the transaction, you know, coming from different perspectives. And, um, you know, I think, again, I'll go back to one of my first statements, which was understanding the nature of the loan, because, you know, I feel like indemnity is a hugely important thing for exchange of culture, right? I mean, that's the whole point of indemnity. Um, But I do think if someone's lending a, a very, very expensive special piece, and indemnity is the only op- option that's available. It's, you know, a lot of those indemnity programs haven't been tested. So I think for some private collectors, especially, they're a little bit leery of the programs. Now, Adrian and I were chatting earlier about that there are some programs, and I can't put my finger on which one. I know I heard recently that there's one that's actually like commercial insurance that would respond first, and then the government backs up that commercial policy, which I personally would feel a little more comfortable with. But I think one of the things to think about with loans is that once the artwork 
is being insured by someone else, which obviously is helpful, again, for cultural exchange, through, either through indemnity or another museum's policy, the person who's lending it, like their broker really has no leverage anymore. The client, the owner of the piece has no leverage in the event of a claim. I'm not saying no, but you know that's not their broker. It's not necessarily their insurance company. So that, that can be a little bit of a point of friction, again, especially if we're talking about those clients where you know, the financial part of the artwork is, you know, their driving force. So are you saying that yeah. in a situation where a commercial broker is first backing the, the loan and then the government's behind that, you're more comfortable with that because you feel like you have more of a direct line for controlling? Well, you wouldn't just be relying on a government to make a claims payment. You know, that's what I worry about is like, all right, so there's like a massive, you know, $500 million dollar, indemnity claim and the process by which that gets paid and how long and who you're dealing with. And, you know, that, I just feel like it's a little untested. So again, if yeah. you're a super financially driven collector with a very expensive special painting, it's, there's a little bit of unknown. And I feel like as a broker, like I have to flesh that out for the client and let them understand that. But also again, understanding what's the nature of this loan? Like, do you want to make it happen? Then do it. If you want to be philanthropic, then you should do it. Right. And I mean, also keep in mind that for U.S. indemnity, the coverage is actually much broader than any commercial policy. Um, they don't have a war exclusion, you know, so the coverage is actually better. Um, and so I try to explain that to collectors uh, when you're negotiating and, and explaining the coverage, then that's always something good to point out. Yeah, most indemnity programs are broader, even some of the European indemnities. There's far fewer exclusions. So I mean, so essentially, your 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 key advice is figure out why you want to to do the loan, and then assess whether indemnity helps you achieve those those goals. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, also too, I I know with U.S. museums, you know, sometimes it's a it's a cost benefit analysis that they do before they put in the indemnity application. Uh, determining whether those indemnity requirements, you know, the couriers, all of the things that indemnity requires, if it makes more sense to actually buy commercial insurance rather than to spend the money on, you know, meeting those indemnity requirements. And sometimes it is more cost effective to actually buy a commercial policy. Um, of course, for the jumbo exhibitions, you know, there's, you, you have to use indemnity. Um, but for something maybe lower on the threshold, you know, that might be a, a, a little little bit of analysis work that should be done before you put in the application just to make sure it's the right fit. Got it. Got it. Um, Amanda, do you have any questions? I'm taking a lot of notes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I meant I meant to 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 say, you know, that's if you have any uh, resources uh, that you want to that you can point people to throughout uh, the discussion at any point, please mention it, and we can uh, we can find it and provide it on the description of the of the show and make it available to people who want to download it uh, later on. Um, I'd like to do a quick shout out to MRM six coming soon later in 2020. <laughs> uh, there will be a chapter in there on fine art insurance written by yours truly. And uh, we're nice. very excited about Aww, that. Nice. So um, I think that anything and everything that we talk about today will be discussed in, in more detail. Um, so you can underline and highlight all you all you wish. So new registrar's Bible coming soon. Yeah, I'll say that um, two of the ARCs board members uh, actually can, were the main editors on that, Tony Kaiser and John Simmons. So we're excited to see MRM6 come out very in a few, I think like in next spring is the last I thing I heard. Day. Yeah, but it's going to be exciting. So Good times. And you already have a, a copy. You're looking for typos, huh? <laughs> uh, well, this is, this is MRM5. Yeah. <laughs> I, thought, I thought it looked familiar. <laughs> yeah. Um, in terms of questions, John, I wonder if we should back up just another step again and talk about two terms that you often see in loan contracts when um, working with a, a, a lender, and that is additional insured versus lost payee. And I wonder if it wouldn't be a little valuable to just talk really quickly about what those terms are and what do they mean and in what situations do they apply? 
I don't know if any, I spoke at ARCS, I don't know, it was in Vancouver, and I got up there and told everybody, and I, John, I think you introduced me for that panel, Maybe. the one I was on with Frank and, yeah. and Michelle and, and El- Elaine, yeah. and anyway, and I basically was like, my life's mission is to debunk the need for additional insured on fine art policies, because it means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So, tear up that loan contract. Yeah, I'm just like, <laughs> ah. So, I mean, just to start off on the very basic level, additional insured is a bastardization of what is a, something that's real under a general liability policy. Yeah. So general liability is, you know, if somebody slips and falls or if you damage someone else's, like, non-art property. So it's slip and falls, third-party bodily injury, third-party property damage. So this is for, you know, if you have – a contractor coming into your museum getting ready to do work you make sure that the museum's listed as additional insured under that contractor's general liability so if that contractor like drops a tool on someone or hurts someone or cracks your marble floor that their general liability policy pays for it and if somebody sues them for bodily injury the museum's covered under their policy so you can see that based on that definition that this is not apply to art at all. Mm-hmm. Like there is no, uh, it's, equi- a, it's a first party yeah. contract, you know, right. and, and with a museum policy, it covers museum collection and temporary loans. So, uh, you know, it, the, it's a first party coverage. Um, it's not really necessary. Loss payee though, could be necessary right. just from the standpoint of making sure that the lender is paid directly. So that's a more appropriate term um, because mm-hmm. really at the end of the day, when people are asking for additional insured and lost payee, odds are they're, what they're really interested in is making sure that they get paid. And that's where the lost payee clause, you know, would be more applicable. If, if additional. Now, that being said, like we, we, we have like fought this battle, like Mary said. <laughs> For many, many years, and finally, I, I can't remember what year, but it's it's been a while. We just went ahead and included it in our loan, our our, our museum policy. Just every but every lender and owner is additional insured and lost payee, as their interest may appear. And so we gave in. That. The whole industry gave yeah. in to the stupidity. We gave in. <laughs> insured. So if, if sure. Thing. Why? Uh, how, it must have come from somewhere, right? Did it come no, from? No, it is. The, it's it's yeah. coming from that general liability thing. So if you are, okay, yeah. so if you're an art handler, like a packer shipper, every time you walk into a building, you have to give them in like a certificate of insurance listing the building as additional insured. So I think people got so used to being seeing that the only time they ever saw any other kind of insurance certificate was for general liability and the person was named as additional insured. So I think it's as simple as, that bastardization of the general liability phrase. The one thing that I think, you know, we we have developed some language because if we're just, you know, at Lloyd's, there's a couple underwriters who will push back. Lloyd's in particular really hates this because, you know, liability isn't even the same thing there as it is here. It doesn't function exactly the same way. So this additional insured thing really irks the Lloyd's underwriters. I mean, they, they understand it's like part of business here, even if it doesn't make sense. And so we developed some language that basically outlines, I think, what people are getting at, which is that, you know, they want to be involved if there's a claim and that they'll get paid directly, which is basically lost payee. But, I mean, there's a whole other set of things that you could open yourself up to as additional insured, like being required to um, testify under oath, you know, in the event of like a suit against the museum. You know, it's like a lot of weird stuff, and I've never seen it happen, but it doesn't mean it can't because – when things go sideways with insurance, I mean, it's all a contract and then it becomes a legal document and a lot of the interpretation and negotiation goes away and it becomes a very black and white contract. So additional insurance is a very odd thing that we all do, but doesn't quite make sense. Got it. But at the same time, no one's ever going to take it out. <laughs> so, I mean, maybe by the time Adrian we'll and I try. retire. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So it'll be like our <laughs> retirement gift to it's each other. Right? Or something. You're be like, thank you. <laughs> like, Here you go, man. Awesome. This, this language has been stricken Somewhere. from all policy. <laughs> but no one should go back to their to their 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 broker and be like, I, I want to take this out. I mean, because it's just not gonna. Happen. No, just yeah, just status quo now. Got it. 
Got it. So, um, one thing I was, I'm always curious about is, and um, is what, so one thing that's, that's a big part of a lot of loans is, especially with, with, with truck trips is the requirement, and this, a lot of it is indemnity, the, the requirement to have a courier on the truck. Now, this, there's been a lot of talk lately about having, about the necessity of that, you know, why, why do you really require that? Because it's actually a little bit more of a risk than it is uh, to the courier, than it is to then maybe even a theft. Everything's GPS controlled, there's cameras, et cetera. Um, sealed trucks is 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 there still a continuing need for this requirement from your point of view? I, I mean, I think the insurance industry really leans on the museum industry to set the best practices on all of this. But yeah. you know, uh, making sure that the that the, that the objects are loaded and unloaded uh, properly. Uh, supervising that uh, is an important role and one of the one of the reasons for having a courier um, I would you know think that that will never go away right well you know you know it's you know it's loaded and supervised at one institution and then it gets unloaded and supervised at another but everything that happens in between you know especially in the United States the trucks never tend to stop um, and so you know, it, it just seems like it's a it's a real risk. But I I, I always understood that as a uh, an insurance requirement and not necessarily a museum requirement. But um, now I think that you know it, basically what what Adrian just said is like the underwriters. I mean, there's a lot of underwriters that might not even totally understand what it means to be a courier. What that means. I mean, probably it's, well, I mean, I, I feel really old, but I think it was about 15 years ago, I took a group of underwriters with Masterpiece to the JFK cargo hold, and we had a registrar talk on the bus on the way there about what it means to be a courier, because, you know, they'll ask for something like a custom crate and a courier. Well, I mean, we all know that a custom crate can mean a lot of things, right? I mean, it could be, I mean, you could say that a very elaborate built out double cardboard box is custom, right? It's, you know, built with foam inserts for that piece, or it could be some, you know, microclimate crate that's $5,000. Like there's, you know, and a lot of these underwriters really rely on the clients to make the right decisions about that each particular situation. And that's also, you know, there's very few claims, so that's been working for them. So I think, yeah. you know, a lot of people like think, oh, this is an insurance requirement. This is an insurance requirement. But most of the time, the insurance underwriter is relying on the client to make the right decision to protect the client, to protect the artwork the best way or the objects the best way. Interesting. And that probably goes to a number of factors, maybe even like who's a qualified handler of, of these objects. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, once you start really, the, you know, once you start having claims, that's where underwriters start paying really close attention, unfortunately. You know, sort of like after Katrina, uh, a lot of underwriters just lost their skin on uh, offsite storage uh, that they didn't know about. They had no idea uh, that people were storing in these, you know, self storage facilities and they, they were flooded. And so as a result of that, a lot of the insurance companies started tightening up their questions about offsite storage and, you know, where, where are things, how are you storing them, um, you know, just because it was a result of a, of a catastrophic claim situation. So if you, start, if you start not having couriers and then all of a sudden we start seeing losses, then, right. you know, yeah, it might become an insurance requirement from that standpoint. It's very reactive in that way. Yeah, and I've had, you know, an instance where someone we needed to ship like two very, very, very expensive paintings. And the underwriter was like, well, we want a follow car, blah, blah, blah. And then the person was like, you know what, I don't, we don't ever use a follow car because it just brings too much attention to the transaction, especially like in New York City. I mean, number one, yeah. logistically, logistically, it's tough to have a truck and a car and have a place to put both of them in the same proximity. And, you know, that, that particular registrar was like, I just don't feel comfortable calling this much attention to what's going on. You know, I'd rather just put two crates in the truck and 
pull mm-hmm. away like we normally do. And if we have more rigmarole, I think if someone was watching, they'd know that there was something offbeat about this particular shipment. So I think and in so that did case, they I did like a back right back. down. Yep, they totally backed yeah. off. Yeah. Because I was able to say, like, this this particular registrar has been transporting these objects back and forth for these people for years and years without any incident. So, and they did back yeah. off. I mean, registrars are really the front line of defense, and underwriters will talk about that all day long, is that, you know, we are relying on registrar community to build those best practices and to know what, you know, to, to do an incredible job of risk management. Um, and that's, you know, they will rely on you for at the end of the day. How do we communicate more with these underwriters? How do we get our word? Is it through the broker? Through brokers, yeah, through the brokers. And many of the major fine art underwriters attend like ARCs and, you know, some of the other conferences. So they're hearing what's happening in the industry as well. Got it. Got it. Yeah, I mean, I've always like, you know, it's always nice as a broker to sort of say to the registrar or any client at, you know, before the renewal, like, hey, what's new? What's going on? Is there anything you want to tell me about? And then that's our job is to actually, you know, provide that narrative to the underwriter to say, hey, these are the new things they're doing. They're going above and beyond, you know, because to just because we can't like rest on our laurels. Like you really have to, you know, if you're doing something new and different, then I want you to tell me about it so I can tell the underwriter so they know that you're putting in the extra effort. And so maybe percent rate increase for everybody this year like maybe i can say but hey you know they just spent you know two hundred thousand dollars on this new system or they've implemented this new training for every single person and spent money on that like can we maybe keep the increase to like two or three percent i mean so that's where you know even though the pricing's so thin on fine art accounts like you know because people are like if i install an alarm will i get a credit and it's like no but if you can give me some sort of narrative, I might be able to offset a change to the policy that maybe wasn't, you know, a positive change, like a price increase or, you know, something like that. Or get you more limits. I mean, especially as art values are increasing ever, every day, you know, it's, it's always important to making sure, making sure that A, that you're insuring to the total value of your loans, because that's your fi- financial obligation to others. Uh, and B, just taking into account the ever-increasing value of your permanent collection and understanding what that spread of risk is within your institution. You know, do you have a gallery that has an aggregation of, you know, three of your heavy hitters, you know, and if something happened in that gallery, what would that look like? Um, you know, making sure that you're ensuring to value. And so maybe you get a rate increase, but maybe you offset that by upping the limits. And so you're getting more bang for your buck. Mm, I see. I see. One thing you've made me think of and between what you've both been saying is that I wonder if it's valuable at times where registrars either maybe they're coming into a new position or it's it's been a long time and they're going to go through and update many of their documents like loan contracts, um, et cetera, et cetera. If it wouldn't be valuable to run that document by their broker to see if 100%. there is anything to recommend that we include, is there anything in here that's unnecessary, things like that. Because what you were saying about, you know, Underwriters really relying on the client to ensure that everything's in place and risk management has been properly assessed. I think about that a lot because our loan contract explicitly states that whoever is lending to us our incoming loan agreement has guaranteed that the object can travel, is packed properly, la 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 la. la. And you know, we really need them to be honest about that because it's our insurance that's covering it. Yeah, hundred percent. If you're, if you, you should have your broker review your loan agreements, your outgoing, incoming, uh, exhibition contracts, reciprocal agreements. I mean, again, it's going back to that stance of making sure that your contracts are running parallel with your insurance policy. So, having having a, a new set of eyes on that anytime is really important. One thing, like a couple of years ago, we got rid of uh, Moss and Vermin, for example, on our, you know, exclusions of our policy. And I still see it in in loan contracts uh, where they have, you know, Moss and Vermin as an exclusion. So, you know, it's sort of a thing where, you know, you got to freshen things up every now and then. So what's the process of... um... Say, say I, I'm with an institution and uh, we get a, a request. We have a loan contract to, uh, and they want to borrow some of our works and um, some of our objects. And, 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 and I come to you, 
uh, our broker and I say, here, uh, here's the loan contract um, and here's what they're offering in terms of insurance, et cetera. Walk, walk us through the process of what that looks like and what you're looking for and, um, and, and the factors. Uh, you're probably looking for, I, I imagine, a handful of specific things, right? Yeah, I mean, number one, who's insuring it? Is it a reputable uh, insurance company that we know of that's financially backed and rated properly? Two, is it an all-risk policy, uh, meaning that everything is covered except for what's excluded? Three, what are those exclusions? Um, are there any wild and crazy exclusions? What are there uh, for, are there, sorry? Are there some typical exclusions? Um, I mean, sometimes with international um, insurance policies, you can see all sorts of, of things. Really I mean, I've seen stuff, vol yeah. volcanoes being excluded, for example, and it's like, <laughs> you know. Or um, sometimes um, um, some European museums will have like really very, very specific conditions on the policy yes. where it's like, you know, if any objects under this size, it has to be under a lock vitrine with a security guard. I mean, there's a lot of conditions for transport display. So you have to be really careful. Cause like if one of those conditions aren't met, then the coverage is null and void. So the, I have seen some very funky things, especially with international loans. Yeah. Sorry. Those are the warranties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So sometimes so they're called like coverage safeguard warranties. And for example, if the alarm system deactivated, then there's no coverage. And it's like, well, if there's a theft at all likelihood, they probably deactivated the alarm system, you know, um, problematic. Right. The thief was reading the contract. And he, had <laughs> he was an insurance nerd like Mary yeah. and I. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so what else? Uh, exclusions. Um, before I interrupted you, I mean, we also I like to look at, um, you know, again, I, at Arcs this past year, I did the the session on facility reports. So I always like to kind of geek out, look at that facility report, um, especially look at, you know, if they're in a flood zone, how close they are to water, if they're any kind of wind zone, any kind of earthquake brush fire, you know, any of that sort of stuff you want to look for because, you know, you, they could be in, you know, a flood zone and the temporary gallery, the gallery where the temporary exhibition is going to be is on the first floor and they only have like a flood sublimit. So it's kind of, you know, are they in a flood zone? Oh, yes, they are. And do they have separate flood coverage or maybe they have a huge flood deductible? So there's sort of that next layer of diving in a little bit um, to uncover some of the more, um, the, what we call it like catastrophic perils and the potential for that and how the policy would respond to those things. Cause that's usually when you'd have some kind of weird restriction, but sometimes you have to specifically ask for it to uncover that because a, a broad loan agreement might sort of be a cursory view and a certificate of insurance would maybe brush over all that as well, unless you specifically asked about it. And what about yeah, but keep in mind also, like you can ask for those terms, but um, you should not be asking for a copy of their whole policy because that includes some confidential information about the the policy limits, for example, of the institution that you know really is not something that should be shared and should be kept close to the the chest uh, for that institution. How much does the uh, do you, the does the political situation of the of the location factor in? Is that something you look at? I mean, again, I think, you know, nobody wants to borrow artwork or lend artwork to someplace where it could get damaged or destroyed. So I think for the most part, that would, again, sort of go back to the expertise of the professionals with the transaction. I mean, underwriters might say like, okay, like, what do we have in Hong Kong? You know, and obviously leading up to Art Basel Hong Kong, there was a lot of talk about that. Um, but I don't know. I mean, Adrian, I haven't run into anything where underwriters are like really leery of a certain, I mean, there are certain countries that are excluded, well, I mean, like countries we're not allowed to do business right. with, but yeah. Mm. Yeah. There's certain countries that are sanctioned that, you know, we just can't a lot, we can't insure it in. Um, but, and then like, for example, I had one come across my desk that was going to Jerusalem and, you know, there's special war coverage there. You know, what does that look like? How does it trigger? is the lender comfortable with that and whether or not it will actually pay out, um, you know, in the event of, of it actually being called up. So, so that's the kind of things that we see. Yeah. Gotcha. 
Um, I mean, I, I, uh, I'm sorry. I just, I just drew a blank. <laughs> what <I was> <laughs> Do you want us that. to do an interpretive dance break? Yeah. <laughs> oh, right. It was uh, yeah, yeah, dance break. <laughs> well, I've got a question, John, if you don't mind me hopping sorry, in real sorry, quick. Sorry, sorry. So you both mentioned about, um, you know, needing to know the coverage that a borrower may have in their policy, but knowing that we can't necessarily ask to see the whole policy because there, there's um, confidential information in it. What like what is as a person who is lending an institution or a private individual lending? What is it that you can ask for without being you know that person? Because <laughs> the one thing I'm yeah, thinking I mean, is should... like making sure that right. whoever is borrowing your piece has enough coverage for your objects, but maybe like everything else that's being lent to them for that show or everything else that they may have in their institution. Yeah, I mean, that's a tricky thing because that, again, that's confidential. And I, I see that with private lenders. They want to make sure that they're going to get paid first, you know, if there's a catastrophic loss. They want to have that assurance because um, they know that the museum is not buying 100% coverage for, you know, their permanent collection and they want that assurance. Um, you know, so we see that come across. But I mean, at the end of the day, you know, you could ask for like a redacted copy of the policy that has things blacked out. Um, you know, that would be one way to review it and then just have your broker take a look at it. Yeah, I mean, that's what I do for clients a lot. I have a couple of clients who are constantly asked for their policies. So I just at renewal every single year, I prepare a highly redacted copy of the policy. I'm like, this isn't anybody else's business. This isn't anybody's business. And I'd black out and then PDF the whole thing. So yeah. You know, people can't see limits or, you know, other additional insureds and other locations that have nothing to do with the loan, you know, like where, right. where their storage is or whatever. Um, I mean, the other thing, too, that I have seen people asking more is going back to that limits. Um, what, you know, Adrian just talked about limits is, you know, just confirming that the institution has enough limit for all the items on loan at the same time as that particular loan. I have seen that question be asked a couple times. And I've seen it go as far as being warrantied on a contract, mm -hmm. but that's like pretty scary. I think I've heard, I don't know for mm -hmm. sure because I'm not a lawyer, but I have heard that that could actually have some implications for people on the board or the directors of the museums, if yeah. that's actually like a warranty in the contract. But it is something you can ask, you know, hey, can you just confirm, especially if it's you're lending to a smaller institution who, you know, might not be keeping track of their loans, just not because they're being devious, but just a mistake. Um, and we also just, you know, if you ever get asked, and not, so some of you on the call might work with um, galleries as well. I mean, uh, galleries are not super well known for being super diligent about tracking their values all the time. So also just asking that question. I mean, if you're going to entrust your object to somebody, then I mean, you can ask questions. I mean, they might not answer all of them, but you can ask them. It's, it seems like, um, you know, we, we're, we're constantly worried about having claims, but really the, at the end of the day, we're, we need to set up a, a pre preventive conservation structure in, in order to avoid any of this stuff. So how much, I mean, you know, if you are working with it with an institution that's borrowing works all the time, um, I mean, are you trusting them to set up that structure, the uh, to have all of these preventive conservation? Uh, what's the term? I, uh, well, yeah, the uh, why why can't I think right now? Uh, to have like protocols. A, yeah, protocols set up. Mm -hmm. so, um, I mean, You're talking yeah. about like oh. making sure that art is safe enough to travel, kind of thing. Like, and travel that the, the galleries are climatized, the the people that are handling it are are professional, and I mean, on some on some level, you know, the the lender is going to require that. But um, you know, who's to say if you if you don't know the the country, if you don't know um, the institution well, how do you ensure um, these these methods? Because nobody nobody ever wants to go through the claim yeah i mean that that is some vetting that has to be done on the institution side uh before you agree to send your stuff out and perhaps maybe that would would be one reason that you send a courier 
you know, yeah. to make sure that the conditions that you, that they have stated are in fact the case, you know, right. um, and maybe starting out with a smaller loan to the institution, you know, and then building that rapport and that trust with the institution um, so that you feel confident that they are upholding their best practices that they say they are. Right. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, what we're going to be discussing in next month is uh, potential changes to um, climate requirements. Um, and based on some recent conservation work that's been done, i.e. it's not as um, it's not as dire if if there's fluctuation beyond uh, someone's desired limits. So you could have your loan contract specify you know 70 degrees, 50 percent rel relative humidity, um, and everyone and their dog is going to claim that yeah we can make that you know no problem we got it, um, but you know at the end of the day you're on the hook if 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 it doesn't and if there's damage and you can trace it back so this this is sort of where i'm coming from with that um you know and if if you can prove that their 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 building and their galleries were not climatized or their storage was not climatized according to the demands then yeah so i mean to, to i think what you're kind of saying is to that point is that usually on a fine art policy there is not an exclusion that says you have to be within this climate range otherwise there's no coverage like you will have coverage it's just after the fact it will be called into question what what was the museum doing why were they not upholding the minimum standards that they said they were doing um it's not like there wouldn't be coverage there would be it's just that eventually you know those questions would be asked Gotcha. So we're coming close to our, our end time. Um, do either of you have any final takeaways you'd like everyone to, to know about? Anything that you especially feel passionate about? I mean, I think I, I would go back to the whole thing about if you have any question, just pick up the phone and call your broker. I mean, really don't grapple with this stuff and try to figure it out and feel embarrassed. I mean, we have people ask us the most rudimentary things all the time. Even the most seasoned registrars ask us really basic questions because we know, like I said, what your brain's filled with, I couldn't do. Yeah. If my life depended on it. So, you know, count on your broker all the time, every day, whatever. You can call your broker as much as you want. We get paid the same no matter what, no matter how little you call or how often you call. So I think that would be, again, from that last experience where someone told me they've had to muster up the courage to call their broker, I was like, that that is not right. Yeah. So just, you That'll know, use you. that resource to help you, help you do your job and make you look good. Yeah, and I guess my my uh, thought would be, you know, read your contracts, read those contracts that you're being asked to sign and make sure that there's not some absolute liability language snuck in there. I've seen it in like many different iterations and it can just, it can really be um, difficult to find sometimes, but you've got to pay attention to it and know before you're signing. And maybe, you know, and, and then, of course, flipping it to your broker and say, well, hey, you know, this doesn't make sense to me. What do you think? Getting their opinion. And I mean, we review loan contracts all the time, you know, um, and at the end of the day, you know, deciding whether or not this is something that you want to negotiate through or if it's something that maybe perhaps should be, you know, you move on. <laughs> right. Well, if um, if uh, people want to get a hold of you, what what's the what's the best way to do that? Get through email is good with me. Yeah, mpontillo at dewittstern dot com. That's m p o n t i l l o, correct? Correct. Uh -huh. uh, I'm on Instagram at read underscore insures underscore art, so you can hit me up there, or email, or phone, or telegraph. Or dove. <laughs> Carrier pigeon. <laughs> like, Carrier anyway, pigeon. you can do it. <laughs> yeah, I'll just add that most of the insurance folks I know, it's kind of like our community where we love to talk about our collections and our management and like insurance, you guys are the same. Like you love to talk about it and you love to teach it. And I've always been very appreciative of the people I've known. 
in your community because I will have usually I do I tend to have a thousand questions of like explain this to me because I'm confused yeah, yeah I mean it's like yeah. as long as people are nice yeah. I'll answer questions all day long right exactly <laughs> <laughs> well thank you so much for thank you for having us yeah, yeah. thank you so much so uh everybody thanks for for tuning in and um of course, this will go out uh, at the end of the week as the podcast, and if you can continue to download that podcast from Apple and Google a Podcasts, Stitcher, and Spotify, and uh, <laughs> and uh, and then of course uh, the uh, Arcs website will have all of the, the descriptions and contact mm -hmm. information. Um, we did have one final comment. Thanks to ARCs and guest speakers tonight. As someone who manages a museum's outgoing loans program, this chat was very beneficial. That came from the ARCs chat founder, Mark Slimmer. Thanks, Mark, for listening. Um, cool. And uh, what, what, what are our other final uh, comments, Amanda? I forget. One of these days, we'll write it down. Sure to <laughs> write it well, down. I yeah. Did. Somewhere. <laughs> Be sure to join us up our, our next chat on April 7th, which will be part two of this yes. series. Yes, this is with the uh, the Getty Conservation Institute discussing our climate parameters. So, mm -hmm. uh, and why we shall re-examine those or should okay. re-examine those. So, um, insurance, damned. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Really appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.